Thanks, Chris. And I assure you, it's the full afternoon tea. <laughs> we won't still be here tomorrow. I, um, I, I just want to iterate one thing before I move further. That was really just to thank Damien. Um, it was a number of months ago, Damien gave me a call and said, does the RAP program would like to partner in this workshop? And I went, you beauty. We needed to do something like that, and if you're going to do it. <laughs> but, but I also wanted just to pick up on the point that, that Patrick made earlier, that it's a, quite a good phrase, I thought, that it takes an ecosystem to, to create or protect an ecosystem. And I'm here to talk about the Restoration Adaptation Program, and that's quite a large collaboration, but it's, in the scheme of things, just one part of, of the next necessary ecosystem that's going to need to occur going forward. And, uh, and Dave, Dave presented a really good case this morning as to why we need to do this. Um, I'm not going to go back through that again, but um, suffice to say, climate mitigation, water quality costs, absolutely critical. We're in a context of what else can we do and can we work with the natural resilience that's still in the system. And, uh, and so this program was born. Um, and again, a little bit was talked a bit about this this morning already, but we, we set ourselves some goals, and it's a bit of an iterative process in that um, part of this phase is to also assess what, might, what goals might be possible. But, uh, you know, there's three, three key things that are up there on the board, and uh, and that's not to say that we're not interested in the smaller scale or the local reef scale or anything else like that. But you know, I'll make one comment. People come to see the Great Barrier Reef because it is the Great Barrier Reef. It's part of the ethos and the psyche of Australia because it is what it is. And, uh, and so this program was quite intentionally set up to explore options that, that really focused in on those key values, that focused in on are they things that could scale and could you do them at the right price point? Just because you can do something at a small scale and you can do it cheaply also doesn't necessarily mean that it's scalable. Um, there's other factors that come into play. So it's about options, it's about possible, it's about should we. And uh, that's interesting. Oh, it's only on the screen. Sorry, my screen has the side of it chopped off. Um, so we started talking about how might you go about doing this, and so a phased approach was looked at. There's no, there's no sort of shovel-ready, low-risk intervention option that will work at scale on the GBR and it'll cost nothing, and it'll be risk-free. Um, unfortunately, if there was, we'd be doing it already. And so uh, we started thinking about how you might actually do this, and so we talked about, well, we actually need to do a concept feasibility assessment. We really want to tease, tease out what's there at the moment and what might be possible going forward and put a bit of a plan around this. But it's not a blank space. It's not that we're starting this um, without any kind of foreknowledge of what, what might be possible or techniques that might be utilised. There's a, lots of people who have been working on this within Australia and today you've already heard a number of people talking about some of the international efforts. And so we wanted to reflect that, but also pull everyone together and, uh, and see whether or not together we could um, start identifying what some of those options might be. And, uh, and so we went to the government and, uh, and they agreed to fund this concept feasibility phase. And I'd like to highlight one thing out of that. I think the reason that we got this funding, this initial funding, was that there was a large body of people all saying the same thing. Um, I'm going to talk about some of, the, some of the key partners just briefly. And we, we formed a partnership and so those, those with the logo, I guess, are, are part of a, a consortium with our kind of uh, organisational partners. And then there's a whole range of other organisations that are participating in this program, but as a united voice, as a group of scientists, as a group of agencies and organisations, we were sending a common message into Canberra that, uh, yes, the reef is under stress, um, but, uh, but it's still resilient and we need to start thinking about additional management options and additional tools and techniques now if we're to have them develop in a time frame, in a timely enough manner that they're going to have impact. And so the concept feasibility phase was born. We formed a group. At the moment, there's about 16 or 18 organisations that we're paying, <laughs> if I was to categorise it that way. Uh, there's about 60 or 70 scientists um, who are being funded through this. There's another, 
I do the maths, but it's close to 100 who are providing in kind, plus all of their peer networks, all of their partnerships, all of the international organisations that we're starting to partner and deal with. So this is a pretty large consortium of, of scientists, of engineers, of customers, of stakeholders, who are all pulling together to have a look at this, I think it was described as a wicked problem a bit earlier. So we set ourselves some targets, some goals for this phase to look at what intervention techniques might be feasible. What's their scalability and cost? Benefit and risks. Can we do a cost benefit? Can we do the classic investment case? There was a talk earlier about trying to value ecosystems. So there's a thread in this, in this uh, work that we're doing this year to, to better understand the value of the GBR and how different attributes drive different values. They can be quite diverse. They may be economic values, they can be social values, and everything in between. And also importantly to look at how we might partner, not just within the Australian context, but within the global context. It's all about creating optionality going forward. So the process, um, we've got about 15 or 16 sub-projects running in parallel, but I've kind of narrowed it down a bit into four. So there's a whole range of work in the stakeholder and partnering space. So <coughs> initial perceptions, and in particular, understanding engagement preferences, working out how we can actually engage and partner with these various stakeholder groups going forward. So they're not a stakeholder group, they're actually a partner and shift that. What's the current regulatory context? How would this fit into that? What might need to be assessed and thought about going forward in risk management? International partners. The key to this is the global problem. I'm talking about this in the context of the GBR, but that Australia's got a lot of other reefs, some spectacular reef systems in Western Australia and the north. Um, and, uh, and so this needs to be a partnership. There's a, a thread of activities that's looking at the interventions themselves. So identification, you know, we're exploring crossover technologies. How do you bring innovation into this space? Um, what's the technology readiness, development requirements? Again, risks and benefits. So there's a thread of activities there and there's a, lots of people are gonna present on some of these matters throughout this conference. So as a modeling aspect of this, what's the counterfactual? Can we assess and can we better predict where we think the reef might go under different climate scenarios, under different, under different <coughs> management scenarios? It's tough, it's a complex question, it's a complex system. But can we model that better so that we can start modeling in some of these interventions and understand things like, what's the scale that you might need to deploy an idea at for it to have a functional impact of X? And then how does that functional impact relate to the values that you're trying to protect? Decision support kind of moves going forward. If you've got techniques that you've developed and tools, at what point do you deploy them or when do you deploy them? How do you make some of those decisions? And then scaling and, and uh, deployment closely linked with the intervention technique. You can't think about these things independently. Um, but where we can, what's some of the concepts that might be sitting on the table that we can explore? What might be the development timelines to bring some of these things to fruition? So can we kind of forecast what a development pathway might look like? Feasibility and limits and important investment requirements. I just put a little arrow in there to say, you know, we're here in this process. So you're going to, uh, I'm not here to, to talk a lot about uh, we've reached this conclusion and this is the answer. And in fact, that's probably not where we're going to land at the end of the year either. And I'll talk a bit more about that. But, um, but we are here to start engaging and uh, as, as a group start talking about some of the findings to date and exploring how we work together going forward. Ultimately the idea here is to start and pull together the values, the risks, the benefits, the costs and make some recommendations around priorities going forward. What's the critical path? Do we focus on a few interventions and try and progress those more quickly? Do we spread the effort across a lot? Um, within that, what's the, what are the things that we should focus on the most? Importantly, what are the unknowns? There's nothing like trying to work some of these things out to work out what you don't know. And, uh, and there's lots of things that we don't know. You're, you know. you're exploring an intervention idea and you go, we just don't know enough about this particular aspect to make any call as to whether or not it would be risky or it would work. Others we know more about, so it's about identifying what we don't know and prioritising some of that, some of the work that needs to happen around this 
so that we can start making some better decisions. And it's about stakeholders. It's about identifying who they are and bringing them in and partnering with them in the broadest possible context. So I'm quickly going to go through uh, some of the interventions that we've been exploring. At the moment, we have them clustered into 15 categories or types. I'm not going to go through all of that. Uh, some of that I'll go through in a bit more detail in the talk I'm giving tomorrow. But you can effectively split them into repair and prevention. Under the repair side, there's the kind of the replenished corals and exploring options from kind of coral aquaculture techniques to actual big ships to remind me to talk about shifting corals. And, and uh, again, there's some talks that you're going to hear about larval transport. Is it feasible to transport larvae that might otherwise be, for example, washed out of the coral sea and place them somewhere where they can have more value? <coughs> Enhancing substrate and recruitment. So there are there things that we can do that help the natural recruitment process. And it could be a quite small scale using devices, and this is a device that Secor have been testing. They have some more modern ones, which I'm sure they'll talk about in their talk over the coming days through to larger devices, and there's another company here, an industry company, Subcon, who are going to talk a bit about some of their methods that they have been trialling. The classic rubble stabilisation, we use a gabion type system, and can we, how far could you take that as a method when you've got an unstable rubble pit? Through to biocontrol, so those are all techniques that are being explored. Biological support, are there things that you could do to assist the coral that, for example, is in the process of leaching but hasn't yet died. It might have, might have shed its zoanthelae, but it's still alive, as an example. So are there things that you can do with nutrients or probiotics or help it re-establish a culture? Are there things that you can do prior to the leaching event, of course, in the same milk? Challenge with those, of course, will be distributing it. Actually, identifying the thing that you might want to do is probably the easy part in this instance. Working out how you deploy it into the system, much more challenging. Unfortunately, can't fly a crop duster out over the reef and drop something on the surface uh, <laughs> if it was only that simple. <laughs> and uh, so, if anyone's got any good ideas on that one, because there's a whole bunch of uh, whole bunch of ideas about treatments that are floating around, the, the the challenge will be how to fit them in. Environmental adjustments. So, there's a range of techniques that we're looking at there, from the small scale. There's some talks here on reef havens, through to what scale might be required in other circumstances. It's a picture of a power station. If it's that large, it's not feasible. Heads up. Through to shading, a range of mechanisms. So, there's a, so there's some work going on in cloud ripening. And yes, I've got a bloke vaping. I'm not advocating any of these techniques, by the way. I'm simply expressing what we're exploring. And uh, it's not as tongue-in-cheek as you might think, in that um, vapour methods, so it's not smoke, but when you take a lipid or a wax and vaporise it, it creates a shading effect. And you could grow algae, use it for nutrient reduction on a reef, turn it into a lipid, vapour it, and provide a shading period and then a hot period. Wild idea, but might have legs. Um, through to things like um, surface films and things like that. This is technology, of course, to keep a surface film away. This was taken in Horizon. But again, there's quite a lot of technology used for a different purpose. Can it be reapplied in this instance? And then the whole kind of assisted evolution space from leveraging variations of genetic stock to selective breeding. And Lena's going to talk about that, so I'll rattle through. What's about time? Importantly, we're also needing to explore things like windows of opportunity, diverse range of, of futures going forward. What techniques might work if we follow 2.6 or 8.5? Is it a 1, 2 or a 4 degree temperature rise? So what's the windows of opportunity? What's the synergies? What, are, what interventions are contingent on other interventions? Where do you get a 1 plus 1 equals 3? So again, those are the types of things we're trying to assess and model. And a couple of final points. It's not a risk-free space. Doing nothing has risk, intervening has risk. We need to understand that and values. So many different value sets on the GBR. Um, and, uh, and so we're all gonna see risks and benefits differently. If we don't go on this journey together, I can only reiterate all of the things that were said this morning, um, then we're gonna end up in the impossible place when we start needing to think about what are we gonna trade off if we need to make trade-offs. So I'd just like to, to, to finish up. Um, 
You know, I, I kind of describe this as we are rattling the tree, not to get money to drop out the bottom, but to get ideas. And, uh, and we're going through this phase. That iterative and integrated approach, however, doesn't stop at the end of the concept feasibility phase. It's going to need to keep going through as we go into an R&D phase. We're still going to be iterating this through this cycle of understanding and working with partners of understanding the ideas and iterating them through so that we progressively make decisions. And uh, so I'd just like to say thanks. Tomorrow, just a little heads up in the talk that I'm giving, I will talk a bit more about development pathways and how we're trying to cluster these together into different development avenues. And I'd just like to say thanks to the entire team um, involved in this program. It's just fantastic to be involved in. Thank you.